Chris and Ed, can you hear me now? We're having technical duty difficulties with this Facebook Live. Can anybody hear me? Please send me a message. Text me, Chris or Ed. Supposed to be live. Just a second. I'm going to text the boys and see if they can see me. Because if they can't, then you can't either. And this is really a very silly process. <laughs> anyway, just in case we are live. Hi, I'm Jill, Boomer Tech Adventures. And uh, if you happen to check in with Ed yesterday, you will know, remember that he said that every day for two weeks, whoops, they can't see me. Okay, Chris can see me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Chris? Text me yes or no, please. I didn't realize I was going to be doing stand-up comedy. This is really crazy. Hello, can you hear me, Chris? Okay, it looks like we are finally live. Well, I started out on my computer, what time is it, about 15 minutes ago to do this Facebook Live, and I was going on and I was into it. I had props, etc. And then I realized I had notes that people couldn't hear me. Well, that wasn't good, so then I had to get into my... Um, I had to get into my Facebook app. Well, first I went to my change to my uh, iPad, went in through the web, and I get the message: "You've got to be using the updated Chrome." I said, oh. "So." Then I tried the Facebook app, and of course it wanted my pa password, and I yeah, couldn't remember what it was, so I had to go look that up. Anyway, we're live. This is the third Boomer Tech 2 o'clock session on uh, ways that maybe we can help uh, time go in a positive way as we all social distance ourselves and stay pretty close to home. Because you know what? We Boomers and Seniors suddenly realize that we are in the highly vulnerable group. Now i got to tell you. I don't feel like I'm a senior citizen, but I guess my pass, my uh, birth certificate says differently. Anyway, so at 2 o'clock every day, we're going to do something a little different. And what I am doing today is I want to share with you three books that I'm enjoying. Now, I am kind of a um, closet introvert. I can be quite happy if I have books to read and my dark chocolate. And I've got my pooch, Sammy, who actually is behaving himself, and we can go outside and go for a walk. But I am enjoying three books right now, and I want to tell you about them. First of all, I have to say, oh, well, I can't show you my tablet, but if you are a public library card holder, you know that, or I hope you know, you can download the app Cloud Library and it will uh, allow you with your library card number to access digital books in your state and you can download or listen to them for free so cloud library if you don't have it on your tablet or your computer you might want to try it okay so let's get back to the books finally thank you for those of you who have been patient now i'm not a big fic fiction reader um I don't enjoy stories about angst, personal growth. Uh, I figure i got enough of that in my life. But I do love 
mysteries. It goes all the way back to my childhood when we lived with my grandfather for a few months. And he had this big comfortable chair. And on one side there was a table. And I have to be honest, there was his scotch and soda. And on the other side was a stack of mysteries. Mickey Spillane, Nero Wolf, uh, Perry Mason. And I started reading them like in sixth and seventh grade. And uh, I've been a mystery fan since. So I'm always looking for uh, mysteries that have a couple of common characteristics. Number one, I really like a good sense of setting and time. I want to feel I'm there. The second, I prefer that it not be blood and gore. I, I don't need that. And the third is at least some of the characters have to be likable. And fourth, I kind of like a quirky mystery. So one author that I've been reading probably for almost 20 years that falls into that category is Archer Mayer. Now, that's probably looking backwards, at least it is on my screen. I don't know how to reverse that. Anyway, Archer Mayer sets his novels in Vermont. And I think that's one of the reasons I like it, being a Northern New Englander. Um, I enjoy reading about places I've been, and I've been through lots and lots of Vermont. Uh, settings and so when he talks about West Brattleboro and going out this road I know exactly where he's going so I really enjoy that his main character is Joe uh, Gunther when we first meet him excuse me when we first meet him uh, he works for the Brattleboro police uh, later on he works for a state agency like I said there uh, there must be 20 of these one a year now, in this particular one called Bury the Lead, the quirky murder goes like this. A body, unfortunately, of a young woman is found at the top of a ski slope. Very quickly, a gentleman who looks like he's on his last legs and not capable of doing anybody any harm confesses. And he will not vary from his confession. And that sends up red flags all over the place. So along with that, there is a grocery di distribution company, local one, in Vermont, that suddenly starts having very strange things happening. Fires in the warehouse, um, communication going screwy, it's family owned, and Lo and behold, the man who confessed to the murder used to work there. So is there any connection? Well, you have to read to find out. Uh, Joe and his cohorts, which include Willie, who is kind of a curmudgeon, uh, but you become fond of him because you know that his way of dealing people really comes from pain in that uh, he had suffered some physical, um, he'd been shot in his arm, doesn't work. And uh, so he's constantly in pain and also doesn't suffer fools well at all. And then there's Sam or Sammy, who we meet very early on, and she develops over the 20 years. And I'll just give you a little hint that a little romance develops between Sammy and um, Willie. Joe is a widower, and through the 20 years, he also has um, several... Um, romances, though it takes Archer Mayer a long time to decide on who might uh, finally um, stay with Joe for the long term. Anyway, the other interesting little quirk in this one is, have you ever thought about murdering somebody with Ebola in Vermont? Interesting. Does it happen? Well, somebody certainly tries to do it. Are they successful? Well, you'll have to read Bury the Lead to find out. The other one, I finished this one and really enjoyed it. The other one um, I'm reading now is uh, The Skeleton's Knee. And here are the two quirky things. First of all, a man dies in the hospital from a bullet wound. Well, that's not so quirky. And it looks like the bullet wound happened 20 years ago. So how does that occur? And while they're researching him, they find a skeleton buried, and the skeleton has an artificial knee. Hmm. Well, you know, all artificial knees have numbers on them, and they can track it back to manufacturer who bought it, etc. 
even the patient. So that's going to be part of the mystery. And how those two are connected, I'm not sure yet. But Archer Mayer, great sense of place. If you like northern New England, you'll feel like you're right there. The people you meet, if you have any experience in rural, uh, rural New England, probably rural U.S. anyway, you will be able to identify them and see some of your neighbors. So try it out. Okay, I said I didn't read much fiction. I read a lot of uh, nonfiction. So to introduce the next book, I'm going to show you this is my passport. <coughs> and in the back of my passport, which a lot of people don't have, I have a yellow form stapled. And I needed to get this when I went to Africa because I possibly was going to enter a country that had yellow fever. Now, I could have gotten into the country, but nobody would have accepted me afterwards if I did not prove that I had immunization for yellow fever. And as I was uh, reading my next book, I thought, boy, I bet the European settlers who went to the Caribbean and the American South uh, to set up their plantations wish they could have had this yellow form. Because you know what? 50 to 60% of them died within a year because of what? The mosquito, the female mosquito. And so that's my next book. It's Timothy Weingard's The Mosquito. A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator. So he looks at world history through the eyes of the female mosquito that originated in Africa and how we may have read that certain battles, the Romans, the Greeks, the, around the Vatican, uh, development of European uh, interests in the New World, North and South, what we call North and South America, all were shaped by the mosquito. For example, mm -hmm, I will tell you that it is the female. There are, there are lots of species of um, mosquitoes, but the two most virulent originated in Africa. In this part of the world, North and South America, the, there were mosquitoes, but they were not deadly until the Europeans started coming. And not only did they bring the mosquitoes with them, but also the slave ships brought the mosquitoes. And there was a lot of you think, well, how do mosquitoes survive? Well, on a ship, you know, there were barrels of water, places for them to uh, lay their eggs, and lots of human bodies for them to bite and spread the disease. So he explains how the deadly diseases of um, the virulent um, mosquito came to this part of the world, and actually how it spread across the world. And so uh, some of the famous battles we've read about really had nothing to do with good generals, but had to do with facts that the people being attacked may have been able to deploy their forces so that the attackers had to camp in these swampy areas. And so by the time they were ready to have their huge battles, the attackers the armies had been decimated by malaria, yellow fever, dysentery, all because of the mosquito. So if you enjoy scientific reading, if you enjoy history, this is a great read. Uh, he's very detailed. He uh, definitely backs up. I was going to say there must be, I don't know, there's a huge bibliography. Now, I will tell you, this isn't a book like a mystery where you sit down and you read for uh, 12 hours, 6 hours, and you finish. It's very dense information. It's very readable, but it's very dense, and so I read it in small parts. And right now, I've been reading about Drake and his uh, journeys around the world and how um, he, his um, soldiers and sailors were also decimated and not as successful in some places that he wanted. All right, so that's book number two. Book number three. 
Food Fix by Mark Hyman. Recommended to me by my silver sneaker instructor. I won't get up and dance and throw my arms around. Uh, but it's fascinating. He uh, is a dog is a doctor, MD, and currently practicing at the Cleveland Clinic in the, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, very well known, very um, successful hospital. And he is a real advocate of helping people live the best lives they can by looking at healthy habits. And he also has very strong feelings about how our food is produced, how it's grown, how it's processed, how it is marketed, and how it is a detriment to the health of Westerners. And I've just begun, and a couple of things that I found really interesting, for example, he says, you know, government... Um, Guidelines say we should be eating 50% uh, of our diet should be vegetables and fruit. Well, you know what? Only 2% of the farmland is dedicated to fruits and vegetables. Not particularly um, healthy. Uh, another thing he mentions, let me just find this. Um, let me read for you. Most farmers no longer grow local, resilient, genetically diverse, and nutrient-dense uh, varieties. They use only genetically uniform, or GMO, high-yield varieties that require intensive use of fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, further destroying the organic matter and biodiversity of the soil that results in less nutrient-dense plants and increased need for irrigation and fertilizer. So, obviously, his point of view is that if we want to, as he says, save our health, our economy, our communities, and our planets, we really need to examine our food source and how big agriculture has such a stranglehold on the farmers and uh, the, and their lobbyists are very successful in Washington. So I look forward to reading uh, Food Fix. As I said, I'm just starting it. Um, he's very readable. Uh, again, he cites, um, he cites sources. He's just not making this up. And his goal is to uh, cut procedures like angioplasties, open heart surgery, cut them in half, do away with them because he feels very strongly that the food we eat is causing many, many, many of our chronic diseases. So there you have it. Archer Mayer, the mosquito, the human history of our deadliest predator. Beware, be scared. <laughs> Buy your bug spray. Don't go out at dusk. And food fix. Think about what we're putting in our mouths. So I hope you find some good books. If you've got a good book, please, uh, I meant to mention it. If you have a favorite mystery author, put it up in the comments. Um, I'll be back later this week with three more books. I haven't decided which ones they will be. They will be uh, eclectic, maybe a fiction, and two more nonfiction. Uh, again, let's see, tomorrow is Monday, so the 2 o'clock show will um, have to do with Chef Toys cooking. Always uh, a delight and always very doable for even the non-cook. Uh, we hope you are social distancing yourself and staying healthy, but also staying in contact using your technology with family and friends. My neighbors next door called me this morning, because they know that I fit the category of elderly, and just to check in to make sure I was okay. This is a person who has six children that she is responsible at six, and I'm thinking she's worried about me. Take care of one another. So, check in tomorrow. I'll see you later in the week. Ed will be on later in the week. And um, eat healthy, watch out for mosquitoes, and entertain yourselves with a good book. Okay, that's it for now. Bye-bye.